Well, welcome everyone. So good to see you in the Lord's house this morning. Welcome those joining us in the fellowship hall, also those online. So good that we can get together like this. You know, when you look around the world today and you look at your part of the world, where does all the evil come from? Where, do all, where, where does all the evil come from? Now, we know we saw last week uh, again that we know that it's all the, ultimately the result of sin. But there's a, and we saw that Jesus has power over that sin, but there's, you know, another dimension to all the bad stuff that is going on around us. And it involves the evil that's around us that's in the spiritual realm. New Testament talks about this uh, no less than 63 times, referring to uh, demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, the devil, you know, Satan, the evil one, uh, demon oppression and possession, spiritual warfare. No less than 63 times. Maybe one of the most familiar passages is from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where we read, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the Bible teaches us that the darkness that's out there is real. And so we need to believe it and to act as if it's real too. Well, welcome again to our series, Jesus Above All. Last week we saw Jesus was, is, is above all of the sin and he uh, is above your sin problem. This week we want to look at, the Jesus's, look at Jesus' power over darkness. Now, right before this passage, Jesus and his disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee. Now, they started from Capernaum, their home base there, and it should have been a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. But the weather started getting rough, and the tiny boat was tossed. If not for the power of our fearless Lord, the disciples would have been lost. Now, we looked at that passage in depth back in March of last year. We Entitled that sermon, The Storm Before the Calm, and to see that, if you, if you want to, you can go back and look then on our YouTube channel or you know, on our website. And we saw then that with Jesus in the boat, I know I'm going to reach the other side. And so we see there Jesus' power then over nature. So as we work our way through Jesus above all, uh, we've seen Jesus is above our sin problem. Uh, We're going to let that sermon serve to show us that Jesus is above nature since it's just so uh, so fresh. And today we're going to look at how Jesus is uh, over darkness. He has power over all darkness. Now notice in this that Jesus is always in charge. He's just always in charge. Now too often when we look at scripture, Satan would just love it if we would look over here when the important thing is really over here. Today that we would get caught up in the demons we get caught up in the pigs, those kinds of things, and not see, uh, you know, and be sidetracked and not see that it's really about Jesus is above all things. We believe as a church that demons are real, that Satan is real. The Bible shows us that evil is not just perpetuated by people, but also by spiritual beings. Jesus taught throughout his ministry uh, that there is this evil, that there are demons, the real, that spiritual forces are part of life, and part of those forces are indeed evil. So today, let's look at Jesus' power over darkness. We're going to look at uh, it from the account in Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at it through looking at four different scenes, uh, scene one, scene two, scene three, that kind of scene, and then take an application then after that. So first look at scene one, a disturbed man. A disturbed man. Look at Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. We're told they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now, as I mentioned, Jesus had just calmed the storm. Remember these uh, very experienced fishermen among the disciples that are fearing for, for their lives. The, the storm was so severe. Jesus says, peace be still, and it's just complete uh, glass calm on the on the lake and now we're told that as they get to the other side then Jesus gets out of the boat a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore not even with a chain 
For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue, subdue him, we're told. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he, could, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So I picture the disciples jumping out of the boat. Now they had just feared for their very lives, and uh, they're jumping back on the shore. Now kissing the ground, if you would. And then they immediately look up, and here comes this crazed man screaming at the top of his lungs at them, coming approaching him, his eyes, you know, got that wild look in his eye, just completely out of control. I can imagine Peter and John glancing at each other and say, hey, let's get back in the boat, get back on the lake, and let's just face the next storm, you know. Now, when you, when you stitch it together, these clues that we find in the Bible, you learn that before God created the heavens and the earth, he created angels, uh, these incredibly powerful, spiritual, supernatural beings. And apparently he gave them that same kind of freedom we have, a free will. And they, like us, some of them at least, chose to push God away. The Bible tells us the greatest of the angels was not content to serve God, but he wanted to be served. So he led a rebellion, and a third of the angels, were told, followed him. They were defeated and cast then out of heaven. The leader was Lucifer the one that we call Satan or the devil. Satan literally means the adversary, and that's what he is. He's your, he's my adversary. The Bible calls the fallen angels who sided with him demons. These are angels who have gone wild, and they still hate God, and they still are at war with God. But they're no match for God whatsoever, and so they are going after whatever God loves, and that's where you and I come into play here. Satan desires to hurt whatever God loves. He wants to hurt you. He wants to hurt your kids. He wants to hurt your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, classmates, and he does. Jesus said, recorded in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, and then I added in there who we've been talking about, Satan and Lucifer and the demons. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. How about that for a mission statement? How about that to put you know, on your resume? This is what I'm all about. I kill, I kill, I steal, and destroy. That's who Satan is and all the demons with him. I, they come, the thief comes to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, now don't get caught up in all that. Look over here. This is what's important. I come that they, that you may have life and have it to the full. Now, we also recently had a sermon on the supernatural from our Core 52 series. So if you want to refresh yourself on that, uh, You'll see that in the book. Uh, it was before we established a website and YouTube channel, so you can get a copy, though, from the, the sound booth on DVD if you'd like. But notice there's only one devil, one Satan, one evil one, but now uh, we know here that there are all, all these other demons, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them we'll see here in a moment. And God has a plan for them. Jesus, as he talks about Judgment Day, he says that uh, you know, the people will be lined up before him. And listen to what he says about some in that group. He, he says to them, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, or demons. So Satan knows, the demons know that one day they're going to wind up in hell. And it makes them so angry that they would take as many of God's servants then, or or. Uh, God's cre creation then with them as they go. Now the phrase itself, demon possession, it doesn't really appear in Scripture. In the same way that uh, baptism isn't a translated word, it comes from the Greek word baptizo, they just kind of bring it right over in English, it doesn't translate that baptizo would mean to plunge, immerse, dip, that kind of thing. They just bring the Greek word right on over, make it into an English word. The same thing is done with the, the word here that often we kind of mistranslate as uh, demon possession, and that's the word daimonizomai, which we have translated for us uh, demon possession often. It really should be demonized. It's the being under the influence of a demon, and there's different degrees of that. So it's not always that a demon is possessing a person when this is mentioned. Every one of us is a target of some kind of demonic influence. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits in the things taught by demons. So all of us can fall under the influence of demons. 
We're demonized. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Verse 3 goes on to say, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And so it's evident that there are these various stages or degrees to which demons can affect, influence, control, or even possess human beings. Now, just right off the bat, a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. Because the spirit in us, we know, we've been told by Scripture, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. But we can be affected by, influenced, uh, and fall then uh, for the uh, deceit then of these demons. Now, in this incident, in Mark 5, we have an extreme case here. Obviously, this was a deeply disturbed man. The man's running down the hill now. He falls then at the feet of Jesus. He was influenced by these evil demons, possessed by them, and even becomes the voice then of this man. Look at verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees, referring to the man in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice now, and this is the demons. What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High, God? In God's name, don't torture me. So the demon is speaking as one for the rest of the demons that he has within him. The demon is immediately obedient to Jesus. Notice there's no pushback here. There's no battle that takes place. Now, the disciples don't quite know who Jesus is yet. They're still trying to figure this out. As they were out on the lake and, and, and as Jesus calms in that storm, they say, who is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. They're still trying to figure it out. The demon knows for sure who this is. This is Jesus. This is the son of the most high God. And so whether the poor guy, the, the, the human, the man, if, if he then sees Jesus and he runs and falls at Jesus' feet, or the demons come and, and make this man fall at Jesus, anyway, this is the proper response when you're in the presence of Jesus to follow Jesus' feet. Um, uh, In the next scene then, scene two then, we see a demonic prayer. A demonic prayer. Look now at verse eight. For Jesus has said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? That's for us, because Jesus would know. My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Then we're told a large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. So Jesus demands his name. He says, my name is Legion. So we know now, we can understand, Legion in Jesus' day is a military term. And at that time it meant 6,000 troops. 6,000. So it's Jesus against thousands and thousands and thousands of these powerful spiritual creatures. And notice, it's no contest at all. Jesus wins, and he still does. Jesus just says, get, and that's it. It's over. No chants, no uh, formulas, no uh, incantation, no magic, no bringing together some things and doing... No, no, no. He didn't call on the power of God. Why? Because he is God. On the other hand, now get this, the demon actually calls on God to help him against Jesus. He says, in God's name, don't torture me. See, the demons ultimately, they know they'll be sent to hell, the lake of fire, to be tormented there day and night forever and ever. And and these demons knew that they're under Jesus' authority. And so they requested, he cast them over into the herd of pigs, Uh, They must fear disembodiment for some reason. They don't want to leave the man and then uh, be out in the open. They want to be in another body, if you would. And we see also here that I guess they can influence animals as well as humans. Um, I I think I knew a dog like that one time. But uh, so, So fully knowing what was next to come, then Jesus grants that prayer of the demons and they enter into the pigs, and that leads to scene number three, deviled ham. Deviled ham. Look now, verse 13. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000, 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. 
Those tending the pigs ran off, reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Now, here I could tell a deviled ham joke, but I'm not going to do that. Now, some of you, are just it just hurts you to just think about all the bacon and all the pulled pork. They're just wasted. I mean, it's just gone now, right? But I also think this steep hill, I wonder if it's so steep that, you know, that they're actually like a cliff, like a little cliff. They're, they're falling in because there's 2,000 of them going. I see that in my mind. I also see maybe a couple of fishermen sitting there telling their stories about the fish they've caught. And one of them says, well, you know, yeah, I'll believe that when pigs fly. And then wee, wee, and they just start just, just flying, you know, bopping into the water there. Well, the demons go into the pigs, the pigs go in the water, the water goes into the pigs, and then they are drowned. And maybe the demons then go to the abyss. We, we just don't know. But a couple of things about pigs. We know pigs are not kosher at this time in the lives of the Jewish people. They are, they're ceremonially unclean, uh, good for nothing in the eyes of uh, the Jew, Jewish people at this time. Uh, the ones who are raised in the pigs, these are descendants of the tribe of Gad, who stayed on the wrong side of the Jordan River, and they're now raising these pigs, the ancestors of those people. And so to a Jewish audience, this would kind of be funny. They would kind of like to have seen that happen. Another thing we see is that the pig's behavior kind of reveals a great deal about the strategy and the purpose of the devil and his demons. It serves to us as a warning to, to teach us of what Satan's ultimate plan is for each of us to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, the story doesn't end with the death of the pigs, however, because we see in scene number four a delivered man. A delivered man. Look at verse 15. When they came to Jesus, these are the ones from the village, you know, the village of the Chroma, they, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons. This guy's been famous, okay? They, they all know about this crazy man. He, the one who had been possessed by this legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. Now, why did Jesus get on the boat back on the other side of the lake and lead the disciples right into the eye of a storm that these seasoned fishermen above the disciples were fearing for their life? Well, because Jesus knew there was a man who needed what he could deliver on the other side of the lake. Now, the people from the village, they come out. They're investigating then the strange event. And they see a man dressed and in his right mind. They, they looked at this demon-crazed man sitting there, transformed into a good man now, a different man. And they said, we don't want anything to do with that. And so they asked, no, it, uh, they said they began to plead. They plead with Jesus, would you just go somewhere else? And it's the same today. People don't talk about God, you know, they just won't talk about him. They, they won't believe in Jesus. I mean, it would be a nice thing to do, they think, you know, kind of. But don't have Jesus ask me or don't have him, you know, start messing with my life or change anything. And you may think it's incredible that people would ask Jesus to just go away, just leave, leave me alone right now. But today, all around the world, in services much like this one, they'll come typically to an end of a service. The Spirit of Jesus would have been moving among the people, like he does here. And he would encourage someone, you know, you need to come to me. I can free you from uh, the troubles. You know, I can change your life. I can deliver you from the bondage of your sin. Let me set you free. And too many then will say, just go away, Jesus. Maybe some other time. Leave me alone. So why is this account recorded here in the Bible? The pages of the Bible are so valuable. At the end of the Gospel of John, it said if everything were recorded that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world, you know, to contain them all. I mean, each page is so, so limited, so valuable. Why, why is this then uh, here in the Bible for us? To teach us about demons? Eh, maybe a little. To scare us? Well, I guess somewhat. To show us one way the pigs can fly? Maybe. But Jesus is showing here that he has all authority. All authority. All power over darkness. All, all power over this demoniac. Uh, over all the evil in the world. He's above it all. He has power. He has authority. 
over all darkness in your world, in our world, in our culture today. And the presence of Jesus alone, no, no incantations, again, no certain techniques, no certain resources to acquire, and then level against uh, evil. No, just Jesus' presence, just even the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. He's got authority over any demons in your life also. We kind of talk about his demon is he, he can't forgive then this one person. Or we say his demon is his, his temper. Or his demon is his, his um, lust or his uh, you know, desire to, uh, uh, for alcohol. And we see here that Jesus is over all of these demons. Even the demons, their, their influence or maybe their, uh, you might say, the, the results of evil that have maybe have come against us. He's over all those things. Now, there may be additional need to fully overcome. There may be need for counseling. There may be needs for even medical attention. Some, maybe just more time for you and Jesus to work through things. But the best step, the first step then, over our difficulties is to invite and to bring Jesus into the equation. And then for the believer, what else do we do then? You know, if we've got, if we've got Jesus in here, what else do we do? Well, there's a number of things. For the Christian, number one is give no footholds, we're told. Give no footholds. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27 tells us, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now here particularly he's talking about do not let uh, the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold. And so that's just an example and it can apply to everyone. Don't give the devil any way he can influence, he can kind of sneak in and, and, and get you to, to, to fall for his temptation, for his scheme. So do not give the devil a foothold. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20, we're told, I do not want you, the apostle Paul writes, to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, which refers to this, but also all that this would represent. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. And so I get questions all the time. What about horoscopes? What about uh, seances? What about contacting the dead? What about ghosts and all that kind of stuff? What about palm reading? What about witchcraft, Wicca, um, horror stories, horror movies, uh, lots of parts of Halloween? Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. Instead, then, number two, be filled, we're told. Be alert, resist, be dressed. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Be very careful then how you live. Are you doing that? I mean, there's some wordings in here where we need to question, we need to check. Are we doing that? Are we being very careful how we live? Not as unwise, but as wise. Are, are we trying to figure out God's will, what the wisdom of God would be, so we can apply it to, our, to just life, to living? Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We're all up in arms now about, you know, the world's becoming like this. The days have always been evil. The days are evil. There's a battle out there. Therefore, do not be foolish about this, but understand what the Lord's will is. How would he have you live in the days of evil? And then he gives an example. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And I believe because of what is said here that we can put any foothold in there because of what it would lead to. But, you know, this one's an example. Do not get drunk on wine with Lisa Bunchy. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Instead, be under the influence, not of a demon, who's, who you've given all these footholds to, possibly, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. First Peter 5 and verse 8 tells us, be alert. Are you alert? Sober mind? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. How's your resistance been? Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And you can also add to that through all the ages. It's, every, it's, a, it's the whole world. It's all through the ages. It's always been going on. Look at James 4 and verse 7. Here you have uh, something to do offensively. Submit yourselves then to God. What's his will? How do I become wise? Submit. That's often submit. Then uh, Secondly, then, a defense and resist the devil. And what will happen? He'll flee from you. He'll flee from you. Ephesians 6, now in verse 11, put on. 
the full armor of God. We've not been left as orphans or with nothing to do here. No, put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the devil's schemes against you, you could add. That's the understanding here. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. Now here's our, here's our defensive and our offensive weaponry here. Be dressed now, be ready. Stand firm then with the belt of truth around your, your waist. We get that then with a Christian perspective about life, seeing what's going on in the world, having the truth in a, uh, that's revealed to us from Scripture, then we can see and know what's going on. We need to know that. We need to know what the truth really is. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, that you're following after the will of God, that you're, you're dressed in the righteousness that's of Christ. This is how uh, uh, defensively you're going to ward these schemes off of the devil. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You're going to be all about what Jesus is all about in his kingdom. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith then to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, what's implied here is if you don't, those flaming arrows are going to get you. Take the helmet of salvation, who you are. You're saved, child of God. you got a future ahead of you. We know what it is. We, we, then, we then are protected by that. We take that up. We have that as our, as our helmet. And then we use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God then, as an offensive weapon then against the devil like Jesus did. Now, here is a side note. It's kind of in here. There's one, one thing here. You know, sometimes you think about when it comes to sharing your faith with others or being a witness for Jesus, you say, well, you know, kind of like that was kind of cool. That guy's a drug addict and he was in a gang and he was up there and he just moved all of us. I wish I could have testimony like that. Or, hey, you know, if I could, I could be in ministry, that could be so cool. Or if I could be a missionary, you know, I could do, I could do some things for the Lord. Look at this example here, verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, because that's what he came over this guy. That's it. Gets in the boat, starts head back then to, to his home base. The man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. So see him falling again at Jesus' feet, begging to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Now, it didn't say enroll in seminary, study your Bible, memorize some verses. Just tell them what God's done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell him in the Decapolis. Now that's the area, 10 cities it means. Now later on when Jesus goes back again, he gets a huge crowd, preaches the gospel to him, and feeds 4,000 of them, performing a miracle there. The people listened to this man and they believed. So the man went, out, went away, began to tell him the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Now part of this testimony would be, that Jesus is God. But the other would be, this is what God's done for me. This is what I know. You can't argue with that when he knows and how God's had mercy on him. But imagine if you would going back to his home, his little house, uh, knock on the door as he comes in, imagine a table there, a, a chair's been empty for a while, a long time. Wife is there, kids are there. They see him come in, kids get behind his wife. They're, they're fearful now. But there's been a difference. And so he says, honey, I met a man named Jesus. You got your husband back. Kids, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, please. But Jesus has given you your daddy back. Simply telling those where you live, where you do life, what God has done in your life. Jesus is still setting people free. He still is. Are you willing to be set free? No matter where, no matter who, no matter the the, the illness, the oppression, the difficulty, the situation, Jesus is above all, fully in charge. And when he arrives on the scene, evil is evicted. And when Jesus so moves, then illness is overcome. Now, that doesn't mean that every problem that someone has leaves their lives when they're baptized into Christ. We don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that, but it does mean that Jesus has power over everything in our lives. 
He's above it all. And we got to remember, he didn't come to earth just to fight physical and spiritual afflictions. He could have just said the word and everyone in the world could have been healed. He could have just rid the whole world of Satan and all the demons. But what we're beginning to see more and more, I think, at least in my life all the time, is he's come to bring salvation and rescue from those things. He's got a bigger mission in mind to announce the arrival of the good news of the kingdom of God. And since sin is the root cause of death and disease and despair and of evil, Jesus came to meet it head on, which necessitated that he live a sinless life himself. He lived in perfect righteousness with God, always perfectly living within God's will in ways that we never could, being tempted in every way as we have been, and yet he never sinned. And as a perfect, sinless, innocent Savior, he became a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. Peter said he bore our sin on the cross, defeating sin, defeating death, but he rises then to new life, and he gives that new life to all that will come to him. So we, we, do, we still pray against disease. We, we pray against oppression and affliction. We do that because we know Jesus has the power. We trust him for that. And while the timing isn't always certain when we pray like that, we know the healing is. And it may not be complete in this life, but we know it will be complete then in the life to come. And that for all of eternity. Healing's promised to every person who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. And these accounts that we see, they're recorded because they represent all of our stories. In, in their own way, when Jesus comes in our life, he brings healing and he brings wholeness. So go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how the Lord has had mercy on you. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we're thankful that we live this side of what you've done for us in Christ. Thankful for your word for your spirit that uh, is within us, for the uh, way you've left us, uh, not as orphans, but you've given us then a uh, uh, counselor, uh, your spirit within us, your, your word, your, your church, fellowship of like believers, the blessing of being your child. So, Father, we pray uh, against uh, evil in our, in our lives in this world. We, we also pray for ourselves and the weakness of our flesh, that you would help us then to become all that you would have us to be in Christ, to use all the, the weapons to, 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 to battle then in this evil world, to battle for righteousness, for goodness, uh, for, for uh, that your son might be lifted up, that all might see him and come to him. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Since the early days of COVID-19 pandemic, we've been longing, looking, uh, desiring, wanting uh, just a one-word treasure, and that's, uh, that's vaccine or, or an antidote that would bolster each of our bodies, that would build a defense against the effects and the ravages of the novel coronavirus. And, you know, we know all about all the pharmaceutical companies and the thousands and thousands of researchers, the billions of dollars to fund untold hours uh, of research in an effort to destroy the curse of this virus and restore life to relationships that have been severed by the virus's spread. We know life is not meant to be lived under these conditions. For months now, we've looked forward to, to an injection that would stop the spread of the disease and the fear and the death. Now, this plague is a snapshot of the broken condition created by our sin. See, our sin tears us away from the one who loves us, the God who has made us and who treasures us de deeply. We know life is not meant to be lived under those circumstances either. Sin introduced to death that can't be prevented by an injection, though. Peter explains what it costs God to reverse the effect, then, of our sinful behavior. He writes, He committed no sin, referring to Jesus. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. 
When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and to the overseer of your souls. We eat this bread. We drink this cup to remind us there's no medicines. There's not a shot we can take that can heal us of what ails us. The vaccine for our rebellion and our brokenness is the crucified body and the shed blood of Jesus. The condition of evil lurking in every heart can be cured only by the blood shed by Jesus on the cross, bringing healing to every follower of his. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can remember now when this uh, bread reminding us of your body, the, the juice reminding us of your sacrifice, the blood shed for us. We thank you for this reminder, and we thank you for the, uh, the, the specialness of this moment as we remember what you've done, as we look into our own lives, admitting we're sinners, Lord, sinners in need of a Savior, and we thank you that you've given us one in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you forget our sin. It's no more we've been dressed now in the robes of Christ's righteousness before you. We ask your spirit to move within us to uh, cause us to confess any sin that's been unconfessed in our lives that our fellowship might be even closer to you. We know, Lord, that you never turn your back on us. You never leave us or forsake us, but our sin distances us from you. Even though we're forgiven, even though we're your child, as we confess, though, our sins, you're faithful, you're just, you forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of that unrighteousness. So hear our prayers now. We also lift this cup in celebration of what you've done and uh, looking forward to the day that you return then for your own. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Would you be seated, please?